Hey man, you're a failure. You're a loser. You're borderline worthless. And for some reason, God still wants to use you. And He will if you let Him. We're going to talk about that and more on today's episode of The Owner's Manual. My name is Caleb Martinez. I'm not trying to be a superhero, guys. I'm not your role model. We have one role model, and that's who we're pursuing. We're studying the book of James verse by verse, sometimes phrase by phrase, sometimes word by word. We're going through it, and we're learning what it means to be just an average man who wants to emulate the Savior. In James chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Who likes failing? Raise your hands. No one. Duh. No one ever wants to come in last place. You, you might not come into first place, but you don't want to come into last place. It's the worst thing in the world. No one likes to fail. Scripture here says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. James is the half-brother of Jesus Christ, and this is the first written book in the New Testament. Obviously, it's not first in our chronological order, but this was the first passage of Scripture written since the Old Testament. And because of that, it's meaningful. Not only is it meaningful because of its place in the order of history, but you got to remember, he's writing to believers. He's writing to Christians. He's not writing to the lost or to the world. He's not even necessarily writing to new babes or new Christians. He's writing to seasoned, tried and true believers, most specifically people who grew up with a Jewish heritage who have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He says, my brethren, my brothers, people that I'm in the fight with and people who share a common bond with me, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. That word diverse just means multiple. So you're not just falling into a test. You're swallowed up. You're encapsulated. And not one test, but multiple tests. Different types and different spectrums all at once. He says, count it all joy when you get swallowed up in a hurricane. You know, when a hurricane comes through, it doesn't just bring rain. It doesn't just bring wind. There's a storm surge that comes with it. And then there's flooding from the storm surge. Or there's flooding from the rain, like what happened in Texas a few years ago. And then there's the wind. And then there's the lightning. And when you put all that together, when the ground is wet and the trees come flying up, and when the wind is happening and the rain with the wind, and then the flooding with the rain and the wind, all of a sudden, you've got one crazy catastrophe. And that's why they're always telling people, get out of Dodge, leave, evacuate, because you don't want to be here when this diverse testing, when this diverse temptation comes to swallow up a landmass or an area. Basically, James is saying, count it all joy when you fall into a spiritual, physical, and or emotional hurricane. Why? Well, there's a reason to it. But I want us to notice something real quick. We need, as men, to acknowledge that we're going to fall. That's the first thing we need to get through our heads and accept into our hearts. We are going to fall. Now, we're never going to ever arrive as Christians. There's never going to be a point in time in our Christian lives here on this earth where we are devoid of sin, where we're devoid of temptation, where we can, no matter what life throws at us, just continue on the straight and narrow. That's not going to happen. And for some reason, us Christians, we have this illusion that we can arrive someday, that someday we can be so righteous and so spiritual that we can talk about sin as a past, as a past burden, as something that Boy, wasn't it terrible back when we were sinners? Man, that was the worst. But now we're saved. Now we're sanctified. And buddy, life is good. Thank you, God, for those blessings. Just keep them coming. No, oh, man. We're sinners. We're vulnerable. And I want to tell you something. If you are not going through a test, buckle up. 
Because from my experience, either you are in a test or a trial, you just came out of a test or, an, or a trial, and you're just about to go into a test or trial. Not or, and. It's about to happen. That time of peace and ceasing of war is to replenish and to re-educate and refresh yourself for the next test and the next storm and the next battle that God has for us. My brothers, testing is coming, the storm is coming, and we must be prepared to fail. I will go as far as to say, not in sin, but it is God's will for us to fail. Controversial much? Scripture didn't make any bones about it. The Bible says, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall. It doesn't say if you fall or if you just, man, you just weren't that diligent that week and oopsie, there I go again messing up. It says, count it all joy when ye fall. Guys, we need to acknowledge we're going to fall. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 30, here's what Isaiah says. Even the youth shall faint and be very weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Utterly fall. Not casually fall, not oopsie doopsie fall. Devastation falling. Even the strongest among us, even the most diligent among us, even the most disciplined and spiritual, and man, they've not missed a day of Bible reading in the last 10 years. And I tell you what, if anyone can articulate scripture as that person, they are going to fall. We quote those scripture verses, there is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And yet, for some reason, we don't let those verses take hold in our hearts to recognize just how sin prone we are. We're so easily tempted to just sugarcoat it and justify it and maybe just turn a blind eye to it because it hurts so much and the conviction is so hard, hot, and heavy to realize just how much we fail God and how miserable it is to recognize we're so far from holiness and we're so far from righteousness. How can we even look our families in the faces as men of God, as preachers, as teachers, as leaders, and tell them honestly, I'm a failure? How in the world can we get the courage to say, I'm a sinner? I'm not choosing sin, I'm not wanting to live in sin, but it's a part of me. And I battle it daily. God wants us to admit that. God wants us to confess it. Do you know, man, that you are capable and vulnerable and have the potential to commit any and every sin in human existence? There's this annoying thing in our lives called the sin nature. That sin nature comes natural to us. God did not put it in us, but it is inbred within our flesh, within our old man, as the Bible puts it. And that old man is so deprived and so deviant and so hellish in nature that any man walking planet Earth, saved or unsaved, is capable of anything imaginable. We ought to put our confidence in God because the heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. You can't trust your heart, Disney movie. You can't follow what your emotions feel like. Your natural man will lead you to utter destruction. No matter how strong you are, no matter how spiritual you are, no matter, no matter how many Bible degrees you have after your fancy title, you're vulnerable. I had the privilege of uh, singing and speaking in a pretty big church out west a couple years ago. And the story was told me of how the church grew to the magnitude that it was. And a missionary had come off a foreign field. This missionary was somewhat high profile. And upon entering the church, God began to bless the church. God began to move. They began to grow in numbers and in influence and in training and in discipleship and in organization and structure. Big building, big crowds, big amount of converts and attendees and the man of God fell 
I don't mean to pick on a preacher. I don't mean to pick on anybody or a believer or a preacher. But this pastor fell in sin. Usually, when we hear about that, there are two camps. Two people. One camp would say, how dare you bring this up? It's probably not true. Probably just some lie of the devil. Just trying to put down God's man. You ought to know better than to talk bad about God's man. He's got enough troubles and enough battles he's facing. The other camp would like to say, throw him away. He's fallen in his calling. He's failed the basic base requirements for being a man of God and for being a pastor, for being a a shepherd, an under-shepherd, if you will. Just throw him out. He better not ever darken the doors of a pulpit ever again. Context shines an awful bright light on most situations, on all situations. As I'm told, the story goes, this pastor fought and fled from temptation for so long, for days, weeks, months. I don't know if it was years. It was a long time until finally the person pursuing him, excuse me, took her hands and grabbed his and forcefully placed them on her body in a sensual nature and looked him in the face and said, tell me you don't like what you feel. How is a human being, yes, a a Christian, a man of God, a pastor, how is a man, a human being, supposed to respond to temptation like that? made the wrong choice. And in the Christian life, there are either good examples or there are examples for good. There's no such thing as a bad example. No such thing as a bad example for the believer. You see, Joseph was a good example. When someone put him in that situation and pursued him like that, he ran away even at the risk of losing his clothes. He, he didn't even care. He was hightailing it out of there because he valued his character, his integrity, and his God so much. And then there's an example for good. You know, when Abraham and Lot chose between the two directions, they were going to grow their families and grow their inheritance. Lot chose the good land. He was making rational decisions. He put his tents facing Sodom. Okay, bad call. When the angels came down, they found him sitting at the gate. He became a man of influence, a man of power. He had character. He had integrity. We know this because when the men came to Lot's house to look for these angels to do unspeakable things with them, the the bad call, but Lot says, hey, take my daughters. They've never known a man. Now that's a miracle. That is an absolute miracle to raise children in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah and to keep them sexually pure the entire time. He was a spiritual man. He kept some level of integrity and faith in his household. He's in the hall of faith, for goodness sake. But it was a wrong decision. He led his family into temptation. And when given the opportunity to stand up for his family, he turned his family over to the world because he thought maybe this was his spiritual calling. I don't know. But his heritage... And his lineage is forever cursed by the decisions he made. And he's not a bad example. He's an example for good because us men of God can look at Lot and say, don't do that. And God will get the glory from it. And unfortunately, that pastor, whose testimony I gave you, he went from being a good example to an example for good. It was not God's will for him to fall into sin, but it is God's will to get the glory even of that garbage, terrible, devastating situation. And if you listen to that story and you take heed and you decide and purpose in your heart right now, I'm vulnerable, I'm susceptible to falling. I gotta get off my high horse. He that thinketh he have whereof to stand, take heed lest he also fall. I am on the verge of failing. God help me then that man, that pastor, that unnamed believer will bring God glory in his devastating testimony 
inspiring God's men to abstain from temptation. <sighs> Not only do we need to acknowledge that we're going to fall, we need to accept our failures. That doesn't mean sugarcoat it. That doesn't mean justify it. But it means accepting the fact that our sovereign, all-powerful God divinely allowed those temptations, those tests in our lives. We'll read later on in James. God doesn't tempt anybody. And he can't even be tempted. He doesn't even know what temptation is as far as how it applies to him. However, God can choose what influences come into our lives. We have the choice. When that test comes to us, we can say no to temptation and yes to God, or we can say yes to temptation and no to God. There is no in-between. And when we fall, when we fail, we have to accept that as part of God's test for us. The result is not probably what God desired, but He does intentionally and divinely intend for us to learn from our failures, to learn from our sin, to learn from our shortcomings, and build on top of those. Still in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, we know the verse. In verse 30, he says, Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. They shall utterly fall, rather. But they that wait upon the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment. You know what happens when God lets us get broke? He wants us to wait. God designed us to be broken. <laughs> A lot of times us, us men, and especially us Christian men, think it is God's will for us to be so strong and so powerful and so disciplined and equipped for battle that we never, ever, ever suffer defeat. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Do you know that God is just so sovereign and just so powerful that He can even use our sin nature for His glory? Once we start getting on a winning streak and we start talking about how many spiritual victories we have and how we're on a good roll, and now our Bible reading comes easy and devotions are just so sweet, and boy, our sermons have so much power and so much fire, and man, I'm leading people to Jesus left and right. God's going to allow some breaking to happen brother the most spiritual man the Bible mentions outside of the person of Jesus Christ his name was Job the Bible says he's perfect and upright man I bring him up in every show it's cause I love the story of Job the Bible says he's perfect and upright one who feared God and eschewed evil he was turned off to sin he hated the very thought of it the Bible says he made sacrifices continually all day every day the Bible says he fell down on his knees. God broke him. If there was anyone in the history of planet Earth who never seemingly needed to be broken, it's Job. God broke him. God allowed him to, as we saw in Isaiah 40, verse 30, God allowed him to fall. Even the youths shall faint and be very weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Men, God wants to break you. He's not going to leave you broke. He's never left anyone broke. If anyone you know is broken right now, that means God just broke them or they're not letting God heal them. God wants to get you running and not be weary, walking and not fainting. God wants to lift you up on eagles' wings. But he's got to break you first. The marvel of Christianity is how there are blessings and brokenness. God divinely desires to be as strong as he can possibly be in our weaknesses. Problem is, 
We're too busy fighting our defeats. We're too busy trying to forget our failures. We're so consumed with picturing the ideal Christian and the ideal man of God that we can be that whenever a failure happens or whenever we fall, we just try to ignore like it never even happened. And God wants to use it. There's someone dear in my life that I'm counseling and discipling with and I keep trying to tell him, don't waste this time of brokenness in your life. Can't you imagine what a waste it would be to have the tears and the sorrow and the heartbreak that God has allowed to come into your life and then to just ignore it and pretend like it's not even happening. Oh, everything's great. Praise the Lord. Everything's good. No, no, it's bad and it hurts. The Bible says be afflicted and mourn in James chapter four. He giveth more grace and that grace is to let us learn even in the worst circumstances and in the worst situations be broken so God can exalt you. In 2 Peter 3.18, the Bible says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, not us, Him. When we don't let God break us, we're taking the glory right out of His hand. You are robbing God of glory by refusing to be broken. My brethren, Count it all joy. Give God the glory when you fall into diverse temptations. God wants to use you, failures and all. God wants to use you, sin filled and all. God wants to use you, temptations and all. You say, Caleb, how can God use me if I have so much sin and I just can't get victory in this and I can't do what God wants me to do till I have victory over this sin? Bubba, God used a smelly, stinking donkey to preach God's word. You think he can't use you the way you are? Think about that, man. Please think about that. God has used way worse sinners than you to preach his message. God has used far greater failures than you for his will to be accomplished. You're nothing special. And that's the way God likes you. Just be an average man. Just follow Christ. Accept that failures are a part of the process. Don't enjoy sin and don't justify sin. Know how bad it is and how much it hurts. Let God break you so He can heal you. After we acknowledge that we're going to fail, after we accept that our failures are a part of the process, man, we need to advance. God didn't break you because He hates you. He broke you to make you the man that He wants you to be. How would you view your test? How would you view your temptation and your trial if you knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that God needed that test to happen in your life? God needed that failure to happen in your life to make you the man of God he wants you to be. How would we view failure then? How would we view sin then? Every time we fall into sin, we're reminded of how weak and vulnerable we are and how great and holy God is and how merciful and loving he is to forgive us in spite of who we are, in spite of what we've done. That ought to do something for you, man. That ought to inspire you. That ought to put a fire in your heart. You are wretched at your very best. Your righteousness has filthy rags and God wants to use you. <sighs> Count it all joy, man. Even when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, not questioning, not doubting, not even wondering, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. I want to give you an example for good, and then I want to give you a good example. Another man that I had the privilege of knowing, I worked with him in a secular job. He was a nice person, a loving guy. Had no idea that several decades before, he was one of the biggest preachers and pastors in that town and in that area. Went to a big time Bible college, graduated with people that if you, if I told you their names, you'd know right off the bat. And I looked at him working in a secular job with me and I asked him, 
one day, I said, brother, what happened? He said, I failed the test, brother. I was in speaking, I was speaking at big time pastors conferences and Bible conferences and missions conferences all over the county, all over the state, all over the country. And I was vulnerable. My home life was rough. I wasn't getting along with my wife. We had division spiritually, emotionally, physically. And I let temptation get in the door. And I failed. And I fell. And I tried to hold in, hold the ends together and fix it and make it work and it wouldn't. And I fell. And when I fell, not one brother, not one believer, not one pastor in whose churches I preached, not one missionary that I hosted in to support to go into the mission field, not one of them called me and told me, God will forgive you, brother. There's mercy. There's grace for you. Don't quit on God. Sure, you might not be able to serve him the way he had originally called you to, but this is a part of the process. He said, not one man of God reached down into his brokenness, into his sin, and into his failing. I said, brother, I'm going to bear your burden with you. I'm going to love you for Jesus' sake. And I'm going to drag you back to Jesus. He said, not one. Now, who knows if it was exactly that way? I don't. I just know the story I was told. And if you find yourself in a similar situation, broken by your circumstances, your surroundings, your situation of time, of this point in time, and you say, no one has loved me, no one has reached out to me, no one has given me hope or grace or forgiveness or mercy, you have someone now. Look, God loves you. God loves you enough to be broken. God loves you enough for this test to destroy everything that you thought about yourself, to destroy your confidences in your flesh, in your ability to speak, in your ability to be a Christian. God sovereignly chose for this to happen for a reason. Don't waste this brokenness. God's going to use you if you let him. In Mark chapter 1, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Another broken man came to Jesus. This is the beginning of Christ's earthly ministry. And in Mark chapter 1, verse number 40, the Bible says, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now leprosy, as far as I understand, it's not a punishment for sin. In the old days, they would have said that quickly. Oh, this man is punished. Either he did something or his parents did something to earn or to merit or to deserve this sin, this, this punishment, this affliction. Serves him right. How dare you? How dare you? When God is allowing someone to be, when God is allowing someone to be broken, to trample on them in their pain and in their sorrow and in their suffering. But this man wasn't feeling sorry for himself. Oh no. This man wasn't saying, why me God? Why me? This man had no self-pity at all. He comes to God and he falls down kneeling. I, inter I inserted the word falling because the Bible says he's coming, he's walking or running and then he kneels down. I'm picturing him falling, just like in James 1 verse 2, and beseeching him. He's begging God, and he says, If you will, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. There's so much in that. Can I paraphrase for you, brother? This leper is saying to God, I acknowledge that you're God. I recognize that you're sovereign, you're omniscient, you know everything. You're sovereign. You're all powerful. You could have kept this leprosy from happening to me. You chose not to, God. 
Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. They're so high. I can't, I can't attain unto it. I can't understand why. But I accept it. I acknowledge that you divinely chose to allow me to be broken for some reason. Maybe that reason is right now. And if you will, God, you can make me clean. You can heal me of this brokenness. But in the context of that statement, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. In that context is, but if thou wilt not, but if you don't will for me to be healed, I accept it. And I'm not going to change my faith. I'm not going to change the level of submission to your will for my life. I will accept that as a part of your divine plan for my life. I'm not God. I have no right to tell you what to do with my life. You are God. You're totally entitled to do with my life whatever you choose. You've bought me with a price. I'm not my own. I'm all yours. The Bible says, And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. How would you like to move God's heart today, man of God? Be broken. Thank Him for it. Be in a test. Be in a trial. And look to God and say, Thank you, God, for this test. Thank you, God, for this trial. I'm considering this joy. Not because I understand it. Not because I like it. Not, definitely not because I want it. But because I know I need it. Because you chose this for me. God, I will not stop. I will not slow down. I won't quit. If you break my legs, I'll just lay here and worship you and have faith in you and trust you till you heal my legs. If you take my health, God, then I'm just going to have faith in you and trust in you and just know that your will is going to be done. Brothers, men of God, you're destined to fall. It's going to happen. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to count it all joy? Or will you let your brokenness turn to bitterness? And let your failures and fallings define you and your faith in God? If you don't get anything from this lecture, I want you to get this. God allows temptations and testings in your life because you need it them and his will will be accomplished and he will get the glory from it if and when we decide to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations guys you'll have to forgive me for being so emotional and to take this lesson so personal I want to confess to you right wherever you're listening to this that I'm a failure that I'm a sinner and I'm humbled and privileged and honored to be used by God. Will you let God use you? Will you let God not only have the good parts of you, but will you let God have the ugly parts, the embarrassing parts, the discouraging parts, the failings? Will you let God have access to even that part of you? You cannot imagine what God can do with our junk if we let Him. If you want to continue in this study, we've got more videos coming. Hope you'll catch us in the next video. If you want to go back and see some of our past videos, the playlist is right here. Look, man, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. It's time to man up. It's time to let God do what he's been wanting to do in your heart and my heart all along. God bless you, man.